Hey guys, JC Peretz here of allstarcharts.com and welcome to the show. So a uh, big shout out to Stock Charts, David Keller, Gretchen, everybody at Stock Charts. I myself have been a Stock Charts user. I'm, I, I gotta be going on like 17 years or so, uh, of maybe 18 years and certainly a paying one. I'm a John Murphy disciple through and through. So as soon as I, I, I realized I could start hearing John Murphy's thoughts, um, you know, I signed up right away and I'm still a subscriber. So it's really cool to be able to do this on stock charts on a regular basis. So thanks again for the invite. For those of you new here, what we normally like to do is three things. The first thing we want to do is I, I you know, I, I told the, the, the folks there, I was like, listen, we got to have something educational, something that JC learned the hard way or something that maybe I learned from somebody else, my predecessors. Usually that's better, but some lessons you just got to learn the hard way. That's just the way it is. Some of the best lessons, of course, you know, let's look at the market, right? what's happening in the market that's why we're here right what charts are we looking at what's what's standing out and then let's take some questions right so always uh info at allstarcharts.com send in your questions and we'll try to answer them here so the first lesson that i think we need to talk about is this whole virtue signaling uh esg situation i think it's something we got to talk about we've been talking about it internally for a while externally at times but really haven't you know, expose that extreme in sentiment where people think that they can save the world through their portfolio, right? And they want to tell everybody about it, how they're ESG investors and all that stuff, which is great. People are welcome to do anything they want. If they want to make donations to the market, great. I'm all for it, right? It's up to us as investors to take that money from them, extract it from the market and put it in our own pockets, right? That's what it is at invest as investors. So I, the lesson here is that if you are in the market, for any reason at all, other than to make money from it, you are very confused, right? And you're destined to lose. Some You see it in politics, right? People investing, uh, basically trying to express their political views through the market. Woo, that's terrible. Don't do that. Um, you know, people that stay away from the market or certain areas because of politics. Like I lived in California when Trump won in 2016 and like everyone was pulling out of the market. And like, we're like, you people are out of your freaking minds. This is the time to be obnoxiously bullish of stocks, right? And uh, people in California, I mean, a lot of people did. I'm picking on California because, you know, obviously it's very left. A lot of them over there, especially where I lived in Northern California, and it was all around me. And, you know, I had a lot of conversations with people that and they knew they were doing something wrong, right? Because now we're having conversations in the first quarter of 2017 and the summer of 2017 when stocks are absolutely ripping. And they're like, yeah, I know it's a bad mistake. I just... I don't like the president. I can't be invested in the market. Like, what? Like, what are you talking about? Um, so that was really interesting. It was a great arbitrage. And then you see it on both sides, right? I'm sure, you know, I, I haven't had this many conversations with hardcore Republicans about getting out of the market because this, but I definitely remember having that conversation when Obama won. Uh, a lot of Republicans scared to death of the market. So I think that's really interesting and an, a beautiful arb to uh, take advantage of and extract their donations. Um, and another good one is this whole virtue signaling sort of situation where people think that they can save the world uh, by investing in certain stocks or whatever it is. And then they look down upon those and claim that the rest of us just stick our heads in the ground and pretend that's not happening and worry about ourselves and screw everybody else in the market. Yes, that's exactly what we're doing. This is a very selfish endeavor. If you are in the market to help people, if you are in the market to save the world, like you're 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 one of the do you're the ones giving donations, right? Yes, the stock market is incredibly selfish. There are no morals. That's not what this is about. Like play by the rules, of course, right? They outline the rules, but within those rules, there are great opportunities to take advantage of mispositioning, which is which is really what this is all about. The narrative and the story being created and told about why you should invest in these, you know, um uh climate friendly companies or whatever uh environmentally friendly companies or over there is a nice story but that story stems from the fact that those types of companies have done very well over the last 10 years people are like well jc the uh, esg stocks are outperforming it's like well there's a lot of growth there's like no energy no old school energy anyway you know the the, the the gross companies that are taking stuff out of the ground and building the machines to take stuff out of the ground and using all this oil and polluting those have been the worst places to be for 10 years but that changed right and now those are the best places to be but the narrative remains because people who fall in love with the stories and follow the cults and stuff like that now it's a religion 
and you can't have regular conversations with those kind of people, right? Which is a beautiful thing, right? That's what makes the market. It's a beautiful thing. So the narrative is there, the sentiment is there, and then we know mathematically that the positioning is not there, right? Because, um, I mean, just look at the weightings and energy in the S&P 500. It's like 2%. NASDAQ is like 0%, not like. NASDAQ is 0% energy, um, you know. So people do not have the exposure to energy where if these energy stocks really do what we think they're doing um, and continue and the uh, natural resources and industrials and all that, that trend continues, those people are, uh, are in trouble and uh, the passive investors lose again. So that's how I see it. And I think as investors, it's a great arbitrage, right? There's always arbitrages all over the place. In this case, I think it's that. I think that's a big one. And the whole sentiment thing is part of the... Uh, the fuel to the fire, if you will. Hey, you see what I did there? That was pretty funny. All right. All right, let's take a step back. All right, so that's the lesson. Don't try to save the world through your portfolio. That is foolish. <laughs> that's the lesson. Okay. Um, and that's a good lesson that I got to learn the easy way, right? That wasn't something that I screwed up on. I never really tried to do that sort of thing. Um, so that was a good lesson that I learned the easy way. Usually it's lessons you have to learn the hard way. All right, so what stood out this week? financials breaking out of a 14 year base baby i mean listen we've been pointing to it it looked like it was gonna happen you know all the indicators were suggesting it was like for example you look at its brothers and sisters and little cousins and stuff broker dealers were already making new all-time highs for a while now regional banks are or you know i mean that's probably the one i'm most surprised about the fact that regional banks came back so strong and I think that's a function of interest rates uh, for sure. The copper gold ratio had been pointing to that, of course, for sure. So the fact that interest rates and regional banks just really caught up in recent months, um, I guess maybe I shouldn't be as surprised as I was, but man, the, the, the rate of acceleration was pretty impressive for sure. And even the insurance names uh, are doing well. Um, so that's the, that's the financials breaking out of a 14 year base, finally above those, um, those great financial crisis highs, right? 14 years. Um, and then, but when you take a step back and you look at financials on a relative basis, we're still down near those 2009 lows, right? We've gone almost nowhere on a relative basis. Talk about underperformance. So people tell me we're in a bubble. I'm like, well, based on my work, it looks like we're just getting going. <laughs> and it looks like there's a lot more room to get back to those former highs, like a lot more room. And this is the big chunk. And maybe you didn't get the bottom. Uh, we certainly did not. Uh, we've been involved since uh, September or so, but um, we didn't get the bottom. That's not the goal. Um, but I don't think this is the top either. I think we really are just getting going. I really, really do. All right, what's going to prove us wrong? I think if we're wrong on the bullish thesis, you know, and, and again, this is a chart that we've been pointing to for a while because we didn't just get bullish stocks yesterday or this week. I mean, we've been very aggressive since the spring of last year. Uh, so, um, you know, after being bearish in February and March, I mean, that crash was, I mean, that was, that was, a, that was a good one for us. Um, but when the data changed and it made more sense to be buying stocks and selling them, you know, we have been looking to things that could potentially point to, uh, us changing our mind, right? We've been bullish for a long time and the entire time it's been like, okay, what is it going to take to get us bearish, right? And we just haven't seen those things play out. It's been the opposite. What's it going to take to confirm that we're right? And those are the things that kept showing up, right? Expansions and new highs, more sectors participating, breath thrusts, um, credit spreads narrowing, which is my point here, is that credit spreads continue to narrow. Even today, NASDAQ's down a percent and a half. As I'm saying this, um, I guess transports are up, Dow's up, uh, S&Ps are down 37 bips. Um, you know, a lot of countries around the world are down and even in this environment, you're getting high yield outperforming treasuries. So that is evidence of credit spreads continuing to narrow. So the bond market is very smart. So notice how we are getting new highs in junk relative to treasuries, confirming the new highs in the S&P 500, as opposed to last year, when this was one of a zillion signals telling you to get the hell out of the market in January and February, with new highs in the S&P 500 credit spreads, they had already been blowing out, right? This ratio was already rolling over, amongst many other things. Regional banks had been rolling over, making new all-time relative lows. Transports making new relative lows. You know, emerging markets had been underperforming forever. Breath deterioration, the value line indexes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many indicators. But of all of them, I would argue the bond market was probably a pretty important one that we were watching. And sure enough, um, as usual, the bond market nailed it um, because that's the biggest money. 
right? That's the biggest money. And what are we seeing today? We're not seeing that, um, that, that uh, you know, the credit spreads widening, right? We're not seeing that. We're just not. So that's something that we're watching. Here's something else that we've been watching. These four lines tend to go up uh, when stocks are going down, right? So you're going to see Aussie yen rolling over. So you're going to see a relative bid in yen relative to Aussie uh, and other currencies as well. But Aussie probably the most obnoxious. Treasury bonds tend to outperform, of course, uh, particularly stocks if stocks are going down. Consumer stable tend to outperform gold, et cetera. What are we seeing? New lows in bonds on a relative basis. New lows in gold on a relative basis. New highs in Aussie yen, which is new lows in this ratio. And what are we seeing? Staples bottomed out two weeks ago. The question is, was that A bottom or was that D, B bottom? And then you can also point to utilities also made new relative lows at the same time, right at the beginning of March. So was that the bottom or is that a bottom, right? Um, I obviously don't know the answer. My crystal ball's in the shop. However, it would behoove us to pay a little extra close attention to what's going on in consumer staples and utilities for that matter is that, you know, because I don't buy that's an interest rate story. If interest rates are going down, fine. Relative bid in staples and utes. Interest rates are going up. So I find that that interesting. So something to watch. I don't think we need to sound the alarms or anything, but um, heads up. A little bit of outperformance out of staples and utes, which is not consistent uh, very, very much with, uh, at least not, um, as long as it's not, you know, outperforming for a while, like dramatically outperforming, like normal sector rotation and just normal movements, fine. That could be it. I don't know, but we'll watch. Something to point out for sure. Um, something else to point out is that we continue to make new all-time highs in the Dow Jones Industrial Average and Dow Jones Transportation Average. Uh, so for you Dow Theory enthusiasts, um, this is always uh, an interesting chart uh, that I like to, people are like, wow, you know, the Dow industrial average is only, is only cool if you're like above 100 years old, you know, or you're like a boomer, you're the boomers are the only ones that look at industrial stocks at the Dow Jones industrial average. If you think that, if you think that the Dow Jones industrial average doesn't matter, you're an idiot. Do not fight Papa Dow. Do not fight Papa Dow. The NASDAQ 100 is not the market. There's zero energy and zero financials in that index. I can't take an index seriously. I mean, to, to, to the extent that it's the most important index in the world. Of course, we look at the NASDAQ, it's very important, but understand what's in it. There's zero financials. By definition, there are zero financials. If you look, if you, if you look at the, if you go to the index and you look at the definition of what's in that index, it literally says X financials. <laughs> and then if you look at the components even deeper, there's zero energy in it also. So to suggest, to be so ignorant, to tell people that the NASDAQ 100 is the market, I, I think nothing could be more foolish. I think you need to look at all of them. Just like the Russell 2000 isn't the, NAS, isn't the market either, right? I think you need to really take a step back and really analyze the market for what it is. I think the Dow Jones Industrial Average does a very good job of indicating where the market's going to go overall. Certainly, seen relative strength over the last over the prior period as you know international has underperformed, emerging markets have, has underperformed. So the Dow Jones Industrial Average stands out relative to other indexes around the world. But I think really, really, I encourage everybody. Uh, to not consider the NASDAQ 100 the stock market. It's just one segment of the market. A very, a very good one uh, over the last 10 years, no doubt about it, right? Uh, but the market goes in cycles. The NASDAQ 100 wasn't very good in 2004, 2005, 2006 when financials and energy were doing so well, right? They weren't calling the NASDAQ 100 the market then, right? So I encourage you to understand, to really dive in, please. I, I mean, if you take anything from this presentation is to dive in and understand the components of the assets that you're analyzing, the assets that you own, particularly indexes and ETFs. I think there's a lot of confusion as to what's in there. So speaking of confusion, I'm getting people telling me that the stock market is in a bubble. And I'm like, stock market is in a bubble. Have you seen the chart of Europe doing nothing for 20 years? Like what bubble? Like we haven't even gotten going yet. Um, you know, Greece, Italy, Spain, all making new highs. Listen, these are great places to visit. Great wine. Some of the best wine in the world. I swear Italy is, you can, the, your money goes the furthest in Italian wine. Like you're getting the best bang for your buck. It's not to say that France doesn't make great wine. France makes incredible wine. Are you kidding me? 
but you're probably going to pay up for that Burgundy or the Bordeaux or the Chateau Neuf du Pop, right? You're going to pay up. Your money's going to go much further in Italy. You're going to get a lot of value for your money. Spain, too, for that matter. Um, uh, great wine, great places, great people. The equities, on the other hand, not exactly quality. Uh, you know, so the way I see it from a risk appetite standpoint, if they're buying these guys, new 52-week highs in Greece, Spain, and Italy, you know, hard for me to be bearish. Uh, Germany fronting the bill out there, making new all-time highs. Can't argue with that. Uh, so the trade in Europe, I like VGK. Uh, look at the weightings here. UK, France, Switzerland, Germany, Netherlands, Sweden, Denmark, Italy, Spain, and Finland. The Helsinki 20. Uh, Helsinki 25? Is it the Helsinki 25 or Helsinki 30? Whatever. Uh, making new highs, by the way. But VGK, that's the trade. Uh, we want to be long VGK if it's above 60 with a target of 82. Long VGK if it's above 60 with a target of 82 bucks. And by the way, if you are interested in these slides, email info at allstarcharts.com. Make sure to use the password, virtue signaling. That's the password. So if you, um, if you want the slides, make sure to enter the password. I can't emphasize that enough because I give presentations in various countries, you know, different topics. You're gonna get like some palm oil future presentation if you do not enter the uh, password. So if you're interested in the slides, info at allstarcharts.com, password virtue signaling, which I believe is what a lot of people rather do than make money in the market, right? Which is fascinating because again, if you're in the market for any other reason other than to make money, like if there's any other factor that you're incorporating into your analysis other than make money, I think you're very confused. And fortunately for us, there are people out there that are very confused. So let's take advantage of that fact. All right. Now let's get into let's get into what's going on. The virtue signalers, they want to tell everybody to invest in ESG and buy these clean companies and all this stuff. We want to do the opposite. We the grosser the company, the more it pollutes the environment, the worse it is for climate, right? Those are the stocks we want to buy. Right? So we want it's the opposite of ESG. We want to take advantage of the unwind in the virtue signalers. Um, so as emerging markets, you know, I think maybe it's not right now, but I think we're close to an epic 12, 13 year breakout. I think it's coming like financials at the top of the hour. You know, I didn't know that it was going to break out like this month. You kind of felt it was coming, right? The more times it knocks on the door, it's only polite to knock on the door a few times before you go storming in, right? So that's what happened in financials. And I mean, just pull it up. I think that's what's happening in emerging markets as well, right? Knocked on the door a few times, politely, and now it's time to go barging in. Chile is the largest, speaking of uh, polluting and, and, you know, just gross companies, right? Chile, largest producer of uh, copper in the world, Breaking out to new 52-week highs, more importantly, or just as important, in my opinion, breaking out above those 2011 highs. So there's a lot going on there in Chile. So here's an interesting one. This is, um, let me just move this out of the way. This is a chemicals company. This is Sociedad Química y Minera de Chile. Sociedad Química y Minera de Chile. It's a $15 billion chemicals stock. We want to buy it only if it's above 60 SQM, only if it's above 60 with a target of 89. And then here's the bad boy, right? This is what's been going on. And uh, by bad, I mean good, right? If you're if you're long this trade, obviously, um, you know how the kids talk, you know, if you say something sick, that means it's good. If something's bad, it's good, right? Um, kids these days. So anyway, this is the value growth rotation. That's what's going on here. Right? These value stocks uh, continue to outperform growth. I think that whole virtue signaling is part of this. You know, price is what dictates the narratives, not the other way around. So these narratives have really developed over the years because of the success that these companies have had, which I firmly believe that is more of a function of the growth outperformance than it is that these companies are really doing anything and, you know, investing in these companies really helps anything. I think uh, if we've proven anything is that it's the, that hasn't happened at all. It's just been part of that growth has done so well. Great. Great. Well, what does that have to do with now? Right? Nothing. But that narrative remains. And I think the sentiment is going to take a while uh, for people to really swallow the fact that 
They need to buy gross energy companies. They need to buy banks that they thought they hated, right? Like that's, that's tough for people. It's tough for people. It's tough for financial advisors to have to convince that story, but that's what's taking place here. And I think it really is part of the interest rate story. As interest rates are going up, investors are less willing to pay those multiples for the gross stocks. They're looking for value. And um, we're seeing it in the market. Look at this ETF, RWBG, sort of does that trade for you. I think it's like leverage long value and then shorts growth. Take a look at the the what exactly is taking place in there. You know, know what you own, um, and then but there's a, and no, notice also it was a leading indicator. It bottomed out and started going up before rates, before the value, the large cap value versus growth uh, started going up. Uh, so let's talk about some of these areas. Industrials. So we talked about Europe. Europe has twice the exposure to industrials than the United States, twice. And in terms of financials, some of the countries have almost twice the exposure to uh, financials, like Spain, for example, is like 30% financials. So there's a lot, you know, part of that bullish Europe trade is that value rotation. Um, and you're seeing that in the industrial stocks. Here's an equally weighted chart of industrials relative to an equally weighted uh, index of the S&P 500. Because when you look at industrials, there's so many different kinds of companies, right? You've got like the Caterpillars and Honeywells of the world. But then you have like staffing companies, you've got railroads, airlines, truckers. I mean, there's all kinds of different companies, you know, aerospace and defense, right? So you've got like all kinds of different industry groups within industrial. So I think an equally weighted basket, you know, kind of tells that story better and, and, and just breaking out of bases relative to an equally weighted version of the S&P 500, right? Notice also how the Dow Jones Industrial Average continues to underperform the transports. Look at some of the components of transports, FedEx and Norfolk Southern, UNP, Kansas City, UPS, um, and then look at industrials, right? Um, you know, the outperformance is in transportation, right? Which are all a part of the S&P industrial sector. You know, we talked about a little bit of relative strength in staples over the last couple of, uh, let's see where staples are today, consumer staples uh, underperforming a little bit. Um, but um uh, definitely underperforming industrials so new highs in industrials relative to staples i think it's an interesting chart uh, to keep an eye on as well uh, a few of the names that stand out jacobs engineering you know these are blasts from the past from prior cycles names i haven't heard in a long time jacobs engineering looks absolutely great we want to be buying smiley faces we want to be selling frowny faces jacobs engineering looks great expediters is another one uh, this is also part of the Dow Jones Transportation Index, uh, part of the S&P Industrials Index, uh, about halfway to our target up near 114. Um, you know, when we, you hear me talk about buying bases, this is exhibit A, right? Look at this beautiful base and expediters. All you have to do is buy that breakout, right? Which we were all over it because we have been stocking this name for so long because it kept knocking on the door. We figured it'd go barging in at some point. Sure enough, it did. But the, look, look at the resolution out of that base is really my point, which is why we look for these bases, right? Beautiful, beautiful breakout. Uh, Caterpillar making new highs. Caterpillar making new highs to me is consistent with higher emerging markets, right? So that, that chart that I showed before where we looked at emerging markets potentially breaking out of this you know, 12, 13 year base, whatever it is from 07, 08, right? That base with Caterpillar making new highs. I mean, these charts, don't they look uh, awfully similar, right? They do to me. Uh, so paychecks, right? This is one of those companies that you wouldn't think it's an industrial stock, but it most certainly is. P-A-Y-X, if we're above 86, we want to be long paychecks. So we don't want to be long if it's below 86, only above it with a target uh, of 127. Look at CNR. This is a cornerstone building, not the Canadian Railroad, right? So keep that in mind. Similar tickers. I know it gets confusing. This is actually a small cap industrial, cornerstone building brand, CNR. And this comes from our, uh, this was on our Under the Hood report in the fourth quarter. So the Under the Hood report is a, is a universe of stocks that are showing an unusual increase in investor interest. And we overlay our technical analysis, which is how we found this bad boy. And we wanted to buy a breakout out of this base, right? Which we love buying breakouts out of this base. So this was no different. Fit uh, the profile that was seeing an unusual increase uh, in activity, in interest, I should say. We had a target of 13 and a half, right? That's the 161.8% extension of this entire base. We got there. Mission accomplished. Great. Now, fast forward three months, and we are back there again, right? So we've consolidated nicely. Looks great. Um, I think we buy it again. It's the right sector, uh, small cap industrials. But what was our ceiling 
is now our floor. So that's how we want to look at it. So while our target was 13 and a half, that target was achieved. Now we only want to be long if we're above that 13 and a half. So that is now our floor. So be long CNR, which is cornerstone building brands. If we're above 13 and a half with a target of 20 bucks, 20 bucks. That's the level. Um, we've got a couple of other stocks. Um, uh, Fastenal, another good one, 44 to the $27 billion industrial. It's above 44. We like this long. AL, so this is Air Lease Corp, a, a mid-cap industrial. If we're above 50, which puts us above those former highs, like this long. And then here's just a really interesting ETF that I think is worth keeping an eye on. Ticker symbol PAVE. You know, uh, some of my smart friends that, you know, follow the economy and fundamentals, they you know, their argument is, you know, the world is just not pricing in how much economic growth we're going to see when the world is back. You know, and I'm not, I'm not Mr. Storyteller. I'm not Mr. Fundamental. Um, but I thought that, that was an interesting point, right? I'm more interested in the price. And of course, narratives follow price. We know that news follows price. It's not the other way around. This ETF is 65% industrials, 21% materials. More importantly, it's only 5% tech, right? So it gets you out of that growth sort of situation and into the other stuff that's working um energy what's energy going to do well we need to get back above those 2016 lows right that's the level those 2016 lows and if as you can see here how did oil react when it got to those six 2016 lows how did crude oil react it got above it so now that it, energy's here how is it going to react when you look at what happened here i think the bet we need to make is that we're gonna get a breakout higher. So if, if you see XLE holding above its 2016 lows and you're not long energy, you're basically shorting, you're indirectly shorting, or and, and even, if, even if you're long energy and don't have enough exposure, again, you're indirectly shorting the space. And that's just not something that we think is smart to do. Look at Saudi Arabia uh, making new 52 week highs with crude oil. Um, this is really it for me, guys. Um, you know, copper breaking out of a 15 year base. What if copper goes to 10? Are you prepared for that? What if oil goes to 200? Are you prepared for that? I don't think investors are, you know, I don't think investors are, and I'm not necessarily saying it's going to get there tomorrow, but I will say that I would be surprised if those things didn't happen. I would be more surprised if oil didn't get to 200 and copper didn't get to 10. That would surprise me more than if they did. How about that? And it's probably why interest rates keep going up, right? Look at five-year, five-year forwards, pricing in inflation, highest levels that we've seen in a long time. Interest rates making new highs, not just in the U.S., but around the world. Why are they doing that? Copper gold and regional bank outperformance has been pricing that in for some time. Uh, so, guys, if you're interested in these slides, email info at allstarcharts.com. Make sure to use the password virtue signaling, and we'll have uh, one question we got time for one question jc what about the relative strength in consumer staples you know we touched on that briefly yeah a little bit of relative strength out of consumer staples over the last couple of weeks yeah i think it's worth paying attention to that you know does it mean that the party's over turn off the light the party's over for you old you know old timers turn off the light the party's over um kids these days don't know what the heck i'm talking about you monday night football fans do um but uh, it happens, right? There's, there's, there's moves that happen in stocks and sectors for all sorts of reasons. It's sustained outperformance out of consumer staples that would get our attention. And we'll be right here talking about it every week. Uh, thanks, everybody. Make sure to info, email info at allstarcharts.com, password virtue signaling for the slides. As always, I'm JC Peretz, All Star Charts. Ping me on Twitter, YouTube, StockTwits, Instagram and Clubhouse at All Star Charts. Say what's up. Hey guys, Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, and we hope you did, hit the like button right below. Also, we have so much new content every day. Consider subscribing to the channel. Just hit the subscribe button in the video or right below. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Have a fantastic day.